So, I'm Drew Parrish, and I, I won the, the the kind of divine lottery for all the R's and a name, which <laughs> explains it. So, first of all, it, it, there's a lot of thank yous out there, but I'd like to personally thank everybody here for being what you are and what you do. And I think everybody deserves a round of applause. <laughs> These are auspicious times. And together, I think we can show that we can do much greater things than ever before. So when prompted with the, the, the mystery theme or whatever, there's a, a, a quote that bounces around across time, which is, they need us more than we need them. Has anybody heard that quote? Anybody raise your hand? I want to see. Who here is from Western Kentucky? Two. <laughs> Those two things really don't connect, but it just sets the tone. So. <laughs> I, I, to, to win today, I have to do a couple of things, which is try not to be too awkward. I'm going to put a, a preface here. This is going to be a serious talk. I'm not going to try and be funny. And I can't cuss, um, which is a very hard thing for me to do. But without further ado, hello, y'all, and good morning. And thank you again for all that you are and all that you do. I've said before, or maybe you can see in my face, I'm very excited. <laughs> right? It's not supposed to be funny. but <laughs> So to set the tone... And the, the theme of mystery, when I said they need us more than we need them, main theme I just want to come out, which basically puts me in the position to be a mirror for all y'all, is to realize that's kind of an arrogant term. They need us more than we need them supposes that we, people in power need the creatives for leisure. Right? People in power or with means need us for their follies, the creators, the people that put things in the world people that put flavor in your mouth in the kitchen, the people that put clothes on your backs and make you look good, right? But as we move along, I think one of the more important things to realize is that it's the it that we create. It is the it that has the power. It is not the they that needs us for the things that we give them. It is it. It's the things that we put in the world that create worlds unto themselves, that we birth, that we labor over, that we're chosen to kind of usher and steward in, that need us now more than ever. No more pulp, no more waste, no more big things, no more just throw it out there, let's data mine and see what happens. The it is more important than it has ever been before. Right? So this is why I put up the painting with Lady Liberty here. Right? Now is kind of a rally call. It's a time of reflection, I think. It's an inflection point in like the tides of the world. It's a time for us to look back and say, all the stuff that we put in, is it worth it? What are the worlds that have created? Right? So with that, I'd like to lead with the main thing to take away the mystery uncovered is the it is the thing of value. And we have to treat it with care. But to understand that, we have to go kind of through the history of our relationships to objects, right? In the beginning, we were pretty much nothing without it, right? I was scurrying about, came out of a cave, smacked down by a saber tooth, right? Next iteration of me comes out, go to try and dig something out of the ground, but I can't move my hands, I can't dig it out of the ground. Right, the next iteration, I need to eat more protein to make my brain develop, I need a rock. So the sacred things that we took from the earth that we made our things to conquer the world around us, right, we chose those things, we picked them, we curated them by what was presented in front of us. And that was the beginning. We had a very intimate relationship, right? It was us, a thing in the world. But then it gets kind of confusing, right? And this is where the they comes back into it. We created a world that was vastly complex and complicated. All the things that we took around, all the rocks that we turned into typewriters somehow, I don't think typewriters are out in Versailles, maybe they were. The pens that we made, the sculptures that we put out, the carriages that we produced, and all of a sudden we became detached. It wasn't me with the rock banging, taking out the saber tooth that took out my great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. It was none of these things. I couldn't navigate the world. So I had to give somebody power to arrange these symbols for me to understand the world that I helped create with an association of an object. It's kind of a messed up switch. We created it, and then we had to create power to give us order. In this new world, our, our bodies were not enough. We couldn't navigate and do the things that we created, that we gave power to people to help us understand. We couldn't do enough of it. 
We couldn't move fast enough. We couldn't dig fast enough. We couldn't do anything. So we had to create machines that understood the world that we created more. So now from here to there, it's between intention and object, the things that we create, constantly being pulled away from the intimacy of the life of the object that we know. And this is a powerful divide. It's a scary divide. It's the modern dilemma. And now as we push forward, it's an even weirder circumstance. Does anybody know what this is an image of? Yeah. It kind of freaks me out. Now we have the worst devices in the world communicating to each other as a novelty, and we watch them on Twitch. There's two Google Homes in a basic argument loop over time, right? But now what's crazy, we've exceeded our muscular bodies. We've exceeded the initial relationship that we had to the world with objects. And now we're exceeding our own mental abilities. So then back to the whole premise and like mystery and the theme. So if we're exceeding our mental abilities, then why? What the hell are we? I cussed once, $25. So we're further detached. You think about somebody put this in the world, and all of a sudden this is a whole new universe. Not just the Google Home, but the AI that's behind it, right? And when you step back and look at the trend, the, the history the, like of social development, right? And the, the premise behind all this is you can argue with it or not. I'm not going to get into it. But it's all the periods, like major things that happened, certain technological elements that, that occurred. Mr. Ian Morse put this together. Personal is right here. So the sum total of everything that we've done up until basically here was kind of a flat line. And all of a sudden, right, goes off the charts. Let's bring it back to where we are. I know this painting. I know a couple people that should. What's great about talking about this subject, everybody's like, no, I can't see it. It's just like one like, guy in a khaki suit. This is Daniel Boone coming through the Cumberland Gap. Good, bad guy, whatever. There, well, we'll get to why he's up there. A lot of people have seen this before. But why this talk, this forum, mysteries of theme, connectivity to objects, creatives, right? A new world is so important here in Kentucky is because all the things I just mentioned pushed people to a bottleneck known as the Cumberland Gap. Daniel Boone and his Transylvania Company pushed through, for good or bad, we'll get into that later, and then 300,000 weirdos started traipsing across the United States, right? The Wilderness Road. You guys are like, where is this going? We're talking about Google at home, now we're like talking about the Transylvania Company. And it hits Louisville, right? Capitalist wheels get even crazier. Boom, Lewis and Clark magnifies. So we got a straight path out west. And what's interesting out of all those endeavors, and this is the thing I love about Kentucky, so we have all the optimism, all the modernist pushes, taking the world to the world's door, where the most ambitious and brave came in. But the most neurotic stayed, right? They were too afraid to go west. And so we began to understand the world at a global scale Right? This huge world, because everybody is traded from the rest of the world through the Cumberland Gap, whatever. We understand it at the world scale, but we also know that we just like local things. And so we are like the best franchisees and franchisers in the world. We know how to make fried chicken, and we know how to make steaks and push them out to everybody else. So you got a lot of neuroses, a lot of optimism, a lot of driving, but we understand inherently as Kentuckians, as people of the Commonwealth, what a globalized platform looks like and the bad that can come with it and the good that can come with it. We are stewards of a great land in that regard. So in talking about the it and what, how we decide to do what we do, right? we understand where we come from. So you set the premise, the Cumberland Gap. And the one thing that I understand that I am Kentucky, and we're going to move to an autobiographical kind of stint here. And one of the things that early on, I would say, influenced me more than anything is the notion that whatever religion, whatever philosophy that you have, something creates something, right? <laughs> Put it in Western terms, it's a divine right. So back to the notion that we are stewards, we are caretakers, we are something, a vessel pushing something much greater than we could ever understand if we opened ourselves to that, right? That we place these objects into the world. Once they're in the world, they create things. More things create more things. The second thing that was a profound influence in the backs of this is St. Thomas Guild. Anybody in here an architect? This is like an AA meeting. No, I don't know. <laughs> so St. Thomas Guild, the medieval architect, it's a profound, they, they understood 
the dilemmas ahead. I go into a field, I want to make a cathedral. How am I going to make a cathedral? It's like the Hitchhiker's Guide thing. I'm going to go to Rome, I'm going to get money. How are you going to get to Rome? I'm going to make a wheel. Okay, how, how many people do you need to protect you? Twelve. How are you going to put them in there? I need to make a basket. Long story short, you come up with things that you need to make the thing that you think that you need to make. You get there, you get the money, you come back. Then you don't know what the hell to do. Excuse me, 25 bucks. So you got to go hire a bunch of people, train craftsmen, make stone, you know, craftsmen to knock out marble, find somebody that can kind of paint, teach them how to paint, all these things. And by the time you're up on the second floor of the cathedral that you're building, you look out and you've built a city of 65,000. It's the proposition of greatness in making these things that you create worlds. But it's understanding that you're that steward for something greater. It's not just pulp. It's like the effort, the community effort to go out and build something much vaster than you've ever understood before. And this comes to fruition in a great moment with the baptistry, Brunelleschi, El Duomo, when he was tasked to make one of the largest domes in the world and one of the most beautiful things in the world, he did basically invent or co-opt a drawing style known as perspectival drawing, right? To be able to convey how to do this thing and understand the logic to do it. So at this point, there is this beautiful switch where the object is not important, the community that makes it is not important, but the tool to make the thing is more important than all of it. Who here has ever used a 3D modeling program? You guys are in Brunelleschi's world. You would never be able to do it unless there was a great proposition to do something that we could have never done before. So technology trumps all, right? So in developing myself as a Kentuckian in this like neurotic state place that we are and trying to understand what, what I want to do, what, how I want to give back or do whatever, I looked at these three paths and I, I realized that I would never be good enough to do any of the things that the greats have done before. So I set out to be basically a plagiarizer and a copier. And so I had a little known thing called Land of Tomorrow, which a lot of people here were a part of, and we believed in it very heavily, and that was to roll out the red carpet and do as much as possible to make the things that people wanted to make. And it was the hopes in this effort, right, that I would gain a mimetic understanding of what the problem is, like underlying the production of things. How do you remove the barriers? How do you make more wheelbarrows if you want to make wheelbarrows without having to ask the question? Right? How do you make more paintings if you want to make more paintings without having to lift a brush? Just to ask bigger, better questions. So this lasted for quite some time. Over 270 artists and over 1,000 objects. And it brings us back to this kernel of why I'm here today and why we're all here today which is understanding the it and the importance going into designing, making, thinking, drawing, writing, or putting flavor in your mouth, as I said before. And all this hits a hyper turn with one company, right? So the trajectory here is just to show you how going through the problem and my understanding of like kind of this dilemma and how it comes to fruition. And so Make Time was built on, you know, on the simple premise that there's a lot of people that make stuff. Who here makes stuff, right, of one form or another? And there's a lot of people that want to make more stuff, right? And these two people really very rarely can get together because of an issue of economy, right? And then also we know that in the region that we live in, it's been decimated in terms of the industrial base, right? So there's a lot of loss, a lot of machines sitting idle, a lot of lost economy, a lot of potential, a lot of things welling up. And then also, back to who we all are, we represent opportunity if placed into these places that make things, right? So you want to make a table. Imagine what that would mean to somebody that had a CNC machine that wasn't operating, right? That's a Texas Roadhouse dinner for one night, right? right? You want to make a car, your Toyota. Imagine if you spread it across 600 machines, like just unused capacity, like in the state. It's a whole lot of Texas Roadhouse dinners. Right? And the whole thing was about and is about the democratization of production in a philosophical context, right? That whoever you are, whatever you're doing, whatever you're making, the idea is that you could reach out and connect to as many CNC machines in the world that you want to connect to. That's a powerful proposition. We go back to like Protestant Revolution. It's like a kin, and I'm going to hate myself for saying this to translating the Bible, right? You take away all the steps, all the power structures, and you collapse them, all the economies, and you put them into the palm of your hand. 
So immediately, you think about why it becomes more important again. You make a stronger object, a life-changing object, something that means something to the world, right? You don't have to question it. You just hit go, right? And then we take a transaction fee, and then we have a Texas Roadhouse dinner. And then other people have Texas Roadhouse dinners. And to kind of understand you know, the thinking and the logic behind all this, there's a bunch of suppliers in the United States, right? All these little yellow dots, there's more of that, right? And each one of these suppliers, right, under the roof, they got a bunch of machines, right? CNC machines. These machines cost a lot of money, okay? A bunch of these CNC machines. And these things can make everything that you've ever wanted. You guys are like, how in the hell we went from like the enlightenment, chicken dinners, and now we're in like a CNC machine floor. And these machines, thanks to technology, are all increasingly connected, right? So you got a machine, I got a machine, my machine's talking to your machine saying, hey, I don't have enough work, and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna send you some work. And my machine's like, okay, thanks. And that's how it goes, right? And what's great is where we come in, we allow them to communicate to the outside world, right? And what's beautiful about all of this, there's data, usage, understanding, right? This is not just a commercial spot for make time, but there's behaviors, right? There's motions that you understand. And all to is back to why are you making what you're making? It takes away all the logistical questions that you have. That's the philosophical goal of all of it. So we, can we all agree that the population's going up, right? Yes. What about things? Things, thing making gonna go up? It is. <laughs> so you're presented two models for production, right? We've got the, the Model T world, right? Which is a hierarchy of power that like in order to make a thing, you gotta call a guy, a lady, and they call a guy, and then next thing you know that you, the creator, the inventor, are like left out on the floor. And then you got this diagram. Who here knows this diagram? Good, AWS. Anybody know what AWS is? Yeah, cool, everybody's like real eager. The reason why I show this is a beautiful thing happened not too long ago where all software, all software platforms can basically be shuffled into the cloud, right? more or less, and you can produce quicker than ever, you can make your wonderful like sausage delivery, like on-demand sausage delivery company overnight and feel really good about it. But what's great about it, when you think about make time and what the model that we represent, the same thing's happening in production. So now you have software, now you have production, the ability to do both are coming into a flat line. So not, now can you not only order sausages or make a platform to make sausages, you can make the machine to make the sausages so that somebody can order the sausages from you on demand. And that is a quantum leap. That means that it all folds into one stream. It is a one-to-one -one relationship between thought, creation, and scale. That is the most powerful thing that I can ever imagine. I'm not just saying it's because we're a part of it, but it, I truly believe it. And this translates to billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars. Most importantly, and the reason why I talk about numbers is that this world is gonna create a trillion dollars more of opportunity, right? Trillion dollars more of tools, like Brunelleschi's perspectival drawing, starting now into the future. The future. <laughs> <laughs> and any way you look at it, it's a lot. I mean, it's just like a lot, a lot of opportunity, a lot of things, but it boils back, goes back down to the, the terms. It's like, why are you doing what you're doing? You know, this isn't like, you know, art school, like crit criticism coming in here, like talking about like why we do what we do, but there's a real social, there's a real economic, there's a real political, there's a real everything thing behind your things. If Heidegger was here, he would slap me. I said, thing, way too many times. It's all for what? And that's kind of the rally call. It's like, you're at like, the zero point in a timeline for everything. It would be awesome if I had the song queued up right, right now from the movie, right? But the reason I put this up is it really is a new organization of doing, right? Every word that you say matters, which is unfortunate for me right now, right? But I firmly believe it is the most optimistic time that we've ever been in. Because politics are dwindling, 
structures are dwindling, right? And you as the creator and the populations that we represent, not even having to ask why or who or ask a hand to pay you to do things, can put things in the world that changes it in a way that nothing from, nothing, <laughs> nothing from the top down can. So if there's anything I can leave you with, it's just when you walk out today, is to know you don't need permission from anybody. You need permission from yourself to allow these things into the world, to change them for whatever way that you think is right. And so when you walk, to know that that burden is real, and it should be real. And we are firm believers in the business that we're in, right, of accelerating you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>